Welcome to Architecture, where you can get smart fast with in-depth interviews of leading tech vendors. I'm Ari Papero, and I'm here with the one and only Brian O'Kelly of Scope 3. Thanks for being here, Brian. Hey, thanks for having me. Very exciting. So tell me about Scope 3. So, you know, I spent 15 years inventing all kinds of different ways to make ad tech more complicated, from the original ad exchange to DSPs and SSPs and RTB and header bidding which should have had a three-letter acronym, but we never figured out a good one. And the more tech we built, you know, the more servers, the more data flowing across the internet, the more impact on consumer devices. And so after taking a couple years out of ad tech, I, I thought a lot about sustainability and the impact that all these servers and all this had on the environment and thought, why isn't the environmental impact of media and advertising something that's factored into this ecosystem? And I started thinking, like, could you measure this? What if you could measure the emission, the carbon footprint of a website or of a mobile app? And the more I dug into this, I started thinking about data sources and ways we could scrape and scan and, and figure this out. And after, you know, six months or so of inventing and engineering, as one does, we were able to build out a data set which could predict really the emissions of all these websites. And the impact of that is that a brand could see that if they invest, you know, $100 million in, in advertising, this is the carbon footprint. This is the emission footprint caused by that advertising. And then the rest of the business sort of flows from there. Well, what do you do about it? What are publishers and platforms and media owners supposed to do what does the internet look like if we factor in sustainability as a core a core aspect of how we make decisions? That's awesome. I'm going to have a lot of follow-up questions when we go into the, the pro how the product works. I'm also going to have a challenge like figuring out where on my website to put this video because I'm going to have to create a new category for you. So but let's start with the very basic. So how long ago did you start the company? I've been working on this on and off for a couple of years, but we formally created the company, I think, in November, and we've all been full-time since then. Okay, great. Now, a lot of folks probably have heard about your work in the commodities work. Could you just briefly explain how this company relates to Waybridge that you had previously been involved with? Yeah, so Waybridge was a, is a commodities technology company that's, I think of it like an ad server for commodities, like for raw metals. So mm -hmm. instead of tracking ads from publisher to advertiser, it's tracking, you know, a bundle of copper from Chile through the Panama Canal up to a, a wire rod mill in Georgia. And that, that technology approach means you can do all kinds of really cool things with, you know, forecasting supply and demand, making trade-offs. And the thing I got really excited about was you could understand the carbon footprint of a finished product. So when you walk into Home Depot and you buy a coil of wire, what is the carbon footprint? It depends on which mine, which smelter, probably mines and smelters, how it was transported to the factory, what processes were used to melt and pull and wrap that, that wire into what you actually buy. So that same idea of almost a bill of materials and source to sink analysis of a product applies equally well in the digital world. Now, of course, the digital world is actually physical because guess what? There's wires and there's steel in data centers and there's you know, people flying on airplanes. So all of this actually connects back to the same supply chains. The thing I liked about Waybridge was that we're dealing with billions and billions of dollars of real things. The challenge was that this algorithm and this approach to managing and capturing sustainability data was, was a horizontal idea. It applied to a whole lot of industries. And so we split Scope 3 out of Waybridge so that Waybridge could focus on the metals industry and, and eventually things like chemicals whereas Scope 3 could be this platform across a whole bunch of industries. And so that was the split. We took a few of the people. We took some of the capital we'd raised. It's the same investors for both. A lot of the people are folks that you know, that I know from AppNexus. It's a very ad techy team with also some Goldman and commodities folks. So kind of sister companies at this point, but we're completely separate from a cap structure. Okay, great. So it's totally separate companies. No one needs to know it more than that, I'd imagine. So how, how big is the company? How many employees then? Right now we're six people. 
We actually have hired a few other folks who are starting in April and early May. We're starting to really ramp up. So not sure your audience is looking for jobs, but we are really, really excited to hire folks who care about sustainability and, you know, want to do stuff at internet scale like ad tech. I, I'm sure there's a lot of ad tech people who want to do penance for their time in ad tech to so do something good in the world. Uh, so it's kind of the ideal uh, combination. So that's awesome. Okay, let, let's talk about the product. So this sounds good, measuring carbon. Um, how do you measure carbon? Like what, maybe it would be helpful to talk about like the life of an ad from a, a DSP through an SSP and how you're able to measure this sort of thing. So one thing that I've been learning, because a lot of this is a learning journey for me, because I'm learning a ton about the environment and how emissions work. I've also been talking to way more brands and agencies than I used to with a a purely ad tech hat on. And when I'm talking to brands, it's not just marketing people. It's also sustainability people, procurement people, even CEOs who care passionately about the environment. And so rather than like the ad tech, like the programmatic flow, it's helped Mm -hmm. me to think about this of what are all, what's the actual value chain of advertising? And so on the left here, you have the creation of ads. So, you know, that's, you know, those beautiful TV ads where like the Jeep is driving through the mountains. Well, getting a Jeep to the mountains and the film crew to film it is actually, you know, causing emissions. Media production, which could be journalists traveling to the Ukraine, or it could be game developers, you know, building 3D models, all the things that are tied to the underlying media matter here. That would also include Anything that we think of as media and digital could apply to print, to audio. So this is not intended to be a digital picture. Ad targeting is where ad tech comes in significantly, which is everything that's happening kind of in the cloud to map a user to an ad before it's even displayed. So programmatic version of this would be all the SSPs and all the auctions that happen to try to match a user to an ad. Then the fourth step would be the display of the ad, which could be lights shining on a physical billboard. It could be the transmission through broadcast to a TV and the electricity from that TV seeing the ad. Could be your mobile phone rendering it on a a mobile browser. Those are the four upstream steps to this process. So if you're a brand and you're looking through your supply chain toward media, those four matter. The other direction is downstream, which means if I'm a if I'm Facebook and I convince you to go buy an SUV, well, aren't I responsible in some way for the advertised emissions that I've caused emissions by getting you to buy a product? So that was what I called downstream emissions. And there's some work going on in different places in the world about that. In France, uh, there's a requirement, a legal requirement that car ads have to have emissions data physically in the ad. Like our warnings, like, you know, smoking will cause cancer. It's right. like driving an SUV will cause pollution. Um, That's smart. So we're not focusing on that right now, but I do think it's going to be increasingly on the radar for both advertisers and publishers platforms, actually the whole ecosystem. Everyone's sort of struggling with, you know, who's responsible for what, which is why I think this picture is a useful map of how the things fit. Is scope three concentrating on everything in the upstream category? So ad creation is actually, there, there's a, an organization called Ad Green that was started out of the UK that is focusing on the sort of the overhead of creating ads. And so I would look at that as an adjacent part of the process. Sure. There's some similar things for media production. I think for most publishers, there's public data or findable data about how many employees you have, how many offices do you have, more and more folks are publishing sustainability reports with things like travel. So the three middle categories are where we're focusing. Media production, ad targeting, and ad display with the idea that these are unique data sets that if you're a brand, you need to figure out how to get as part of your overall net zero, scope three, ESG reporting work. So in terms of the customer, let's, let's talk about the customer persona, then talk about how they purchase what you're offering. So like, I'd assume brands are a big part of the customer persona because I've even seen it myself on RFPs that uh, brands and agencies are starting to ask for this data as part of their vendor selection. Right. Yeah. We thought a lot about who our customer is. This is 
kind of a two-sided marketplace. There's brands on one side and then there's like publishers and vendors on the other side. And so one important part about Scope 3 is that we're a public benefit corporation. Our core mission, we're for profit, but we really want to make a huge impact from an environmental perspective. And so one side was, how do we cause rapid decarbonization of advertising and media? And the other was, how do we make money? And our decision was that we wanted to give our data to brands so that they could measure their footprint. They need this for regulatory ESG purposes anyway. But if they don't have accurate data, they can't make decisions. And our theory is that if they see the data, then it will be fairly obvious what they need to do to shift spend to lower carbon channels, publishers, suppliers. And then on the supply side, the paying customer for us is a publisher that wants to offer low carbon media products. It could be an ad tech company that wants to figure out how to do green PMPs. It could be a trading desk or algorithm building company that wants to do carbon optimization next to their other KPI optimization. So our current customer set is a mix of those publishers, ad tech companies, trading desks, who are basically building carbon into their core business model. And our business model is either subscription, where we just license the data, or we just started doing a CPM fee, where sort of the cold start problem is if you want to offer these products, you're not sure what the demand is, paying us five grand a month or 10 grand a month, hoping that there's revenue doesn't make sense for some of the smaller companies. And so the CPM option is an easier way to start. Even though I was trying to avoid ad tech-like pricing, I realized that it's hard to work with companies that are transactional if you're not transactional. So we could probably talk about that subject for an hour. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm a publisher. I'm like the Daily Mail or someone like that. And I want to start offering carbon-free ad products. So I call you up and what do I get? Like how, what's the product? So the first thing we do is we do a carbon modeling exercise. So there's basically three parts. One is we look at your properties. So Daily Mail has Mail Online. It has an Android app. It has an iPhone app. There's other sister properties. Let's just focus on those. There's different page layouts on different parts of those properties. So for instance, the homepage has a very different ad layout than an article page. So our first step is to sort of model out what those layouts are look at traffic patterns across different regions. So there's a UK version of the Daily Mail site and there's a US version. And there's actually a couple other variants in there too. Like, is there a homepage takeover? You only have one ad versus if there's no homepage takeover, you get more. So that's our first sort of mapping is just to understand, you know, traffic by page layout. We have a scraper system that can basically go in and look at pages and try to understand different layouts looks at CPU usage, looks at network transmission, maps out every vendor. So we can get a pretty good sense of like what ad tech is on which page, are using analytics software, are there chat apps, anything that's kind of on the page we can find out. So we sort of work with the publisher to say, here's what we think you're doing, tell us what you're actually doing, and we tick and tie that. Part of that is a deep dive on ad tech because there's a lot of stuff that's server-side configuration that we wanna confirm we do use some third-party data sources from like analytics companies. We also have some DSP data that has supply chain. So we kind of know who's serving what from where, but it's nice to confirm it. The next thing we do is we look at overhead. So how many journalists do you have? How many offices do you have? Daily Mail actually publishes a public sustainability report as part of DMGT. I, I know a lot about who publishes sustainability reports. But DMGT, the, that was yeah, the was Daily Mail is. something trust. Okay. They went private or sold it off. So the one problem with public reports is they're often lagging by 18 or 24 months. So in this case, we would sign an NDA with the Daily Mail and we would actually get their sustainability partners, whoever they used, to give us just the breakout for what's left, just the Daily Mail pieces. So we take that, we take the sort of ad tech and page information and we build a model of basically emissions per impression is, is the output. And that's going to differ desktop and mobile because there's different layouts for each. It's going to differ in different countries. It's going to differ homepage versus article page. 
So we have this more detailed model, but we can also zoom that up to just a number. So that's all free. Like we don't charge publishers for any of that work because we think it's really important to have accurate measure. So that was the free part. If you want to offer a carbon neutral ad product, you need to then tie that to an offset. So we offer a pass-through offset portfolio. So if you just want to use ours, it's a very high quality, very expensive portfolio. So we copied Microsoft and Stripe, who basically went out and got some really high-end permanent carbon removal projects. Biochar is an example. That's like 200 bucks a ton versus maybe you're planting mangroves in Indonesia and that's only 25 bucks a ton. We're, we're blending both because we don't think that's the right, we're saying everything has to be biochar, but the idea that you're making a real, you're actually pulling carbon out of the atmosphere is really important to do an offset. This also counters greenwashing claims. You'll see a lot of environmentalists say offsets are bullshit. You know, it's an excuse to pollute. There's truth to that. I'm just not convinced that real carbon removal is bad. In fact, if we want to, even if we get to one and a half degrees of, you know, warming, the only way to go down is to remove carbon. So I feel like investing in carbon removal is key. We can come back to some of our ideas about how to choose those products, the projects that are doing removal, but that's the basic idea. So you'd take our fee, let's say you're doing our CPM fee, a 10 cent fee for our data, plus let's say it's a 12 cent additional CPM fee for those offsets. That's a 22 cent additional price that lets you charge a buyer for a green media product. Now, maybe you want to mark it up. Maybe you want to charge 30 cents. Maybe you want to eat that cost and pass through no additional fees. One thing publishers have talked about is, well, maybe for spend commitments, if a agency wants to spend more, or if a buyer will commit to spending $100,000, we'll cover their carbon. So it can be an incentive. It could be a way to charge more. What I think is over time is going to be the fall, is that buyers are going to say, especially a lot of the big brands are, look, I don't want to pay for carbon. I don't want to inherit any carbon from this process. I'm only going to buy from publishers or ad tech companies that are willing to do this. That's why I think the subscription model makes more sense for us. I don't want to be another ad tech tax. I want to be always on working with a bunch of different partners that effectively use us to measure what that cost is. And that becomes, I guess, offsets would be an ad tech tax, but they would be a very direct, transparent tax that goes directly to either a nonprofit or to a portfolio of projects that everyone can track back. Yeah, I got it. Okay, so let me repeat back what you said, make sure everyone understands it. Publisher, there's an audit process that's free, that's both technical and, you know, some operational data. Around, around how long does that take? Uh, we've done it in a couple of days. I mean, there's a probably an hour of us asking questions. We do a data request. Mm -hmm. If the publisher's done a little bit of work on emission stuff, that's pretty fast. We also have some third-party partners to refer to. That That's where it takes time, is just grabbing the data we need. And then we do like an hour long, like come together, review the data meeting. So it's not that much time. It's just a matter of like, how long does it take to pull some of the basic okay. pieces? So then the publisher now goes to market and it says, hey, we have this no carbon product. And when they sell that product, you get a fee for your service. And then you also facilitate a pass through offset that you're not marking up. Correct. Or the publisher can do it themselves. So if they want to okay. go choose their own projects, right fine, as long as it meets standards. And those standards shouldn't be ours. They should be mm -hmm. industry or government defined because there's going to be regulatory requirements here. So we're careful to say that, you know, we're, we're being very aggressive on quality for our offset portfolio. But look, if you're in, I don't know, the Netherlands and you really want to focus on a project in the Netherlands, that's awesome. You should do that. And maybe the Netherlands market will come together and they'll create their own portfolio. We'd love that. In fact, we'd be happy to help operate that because that's how it really becomes real for everyone in the industry. It's like you can walk down to the dike or, you know, seawall or whatever it is and be like, we did this versus like, I don't know, like some listing and like, I'm not going to go to Indonesia to check out the mangroves, but sure. I think it's important that we do plant them. Sure. It's programmatic paid for this mangrove. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when we talk about the technical layout of the site, that's kind of fascinating and probably could be, we could talk about that for a long time. 
But would you say that in general, your technology would be penalizing more complex sites with over too much overhead, too many tags, too much JavaScript versus rewarding simpler sites? Yeah. I think ads.txt in, in the programmatic world is a pretty good proxy for ad tech overhead. Mm-hmm. Um, I think video is heavier than banner, not by so much that you shouldn't do it, but if you had mm-hmm. to choose between you know, a super heavy video ad, one thing that's clear from our analysis so far is there's lots of like pointless waste. There's a lot of rendering that happens that is really easy to turn off. There's a bot traffic, like maybe you should just check for the bot before you render the page and call mm-hmm. everybody as opposed to doing it after. You know, do we really need to run every single ad provider? If you know you're going to do a takeover of a page and you're not going to show any other ads, why are you running all the auctions? So there's a lot of just spurious stuff. I think SSPs have a lot to think about in terms of how often they call out to DSPs. You know, do you need to call every DSP on every page view in every market? So it's almost like the opposite of SPO. I feel like the supply side needs to do DPO. I'm annoyed that somebody else came up with that. So I can't even write and buck on ads <laughs> posts. So good job, ad tech. You figured it out. But it's all very opaque. I don't think folks are publishing their bid throttling strategies. And I think that's really important to know is what is happening downstream. We have a graph, like a directed acyclic graph of every call from one site. And it doesn't even fit on a screen. It's so complicated, which doesn't surprise anyone in ad tech, but it is problematic if you're trying to manage carbon. Well, it's sort of a tragedy of the commons problem where a publisher can add someone to their header and make one cent more and it costs them nothing. So they do it, but it costs other people. It costs the DSP money. um, It causes complexity. And now obviously it wastes energy which has just been um, something that no one's ever been able to measure before. Yeah, it's an arms race. And I I was talking to a CEO of an SSP recently who said that they've seen like a 10x increase in traffic to them Mm. uh, over the last three or four years, which is because because it works, your point. Like you make a little bit more money the more time you call the publisher, but it's not like there's more inventory being created. It's just all of these tricks of running open bidding and running cam and running pre-bid like that just creates a tiny little bit of revenue right so i think what trade desk has done with open path is really interesting i think there's a lot of agency groups that are thinking about real consolidation if i could do one thing with my wand i would say that getting supply chain object adoption and being really strict about reselling would be super obvious as a way to prevent this massive duplication of the same exact ad request with with no impact to really any advertiser or publisher. It probably penalizes some of the content farms or made for advertising sites that are really good at gaming this. I mean, everyone listening to this probably knows these are problems we've all known about for years. I'm thinking that sustainability is a really strong excuse to ask these hard questions with not just, you know, some ad tech nerds who are worried about it, but this is the board, this is the CEO of the brand, this is investors, this is employees who are really, really focused on this. I talked to an exec at a major holding company yesterday. He said, I have 150,000 colleagues here, all of whom think that climate is the most important thing. I doubt that's actually true, but there's a lot of truth to the fact that employee advocacy really matters here. And so, you know, even if you don't quit your job and come work for Scope 3, People in ad tech can make a huge impact just by, you know, thinking about this as part of their day job. Got it. So you mentioned exchanges. So how does an exchange use your product if they don't have, you know, a page to analyze? They obviously have a lot of servers, a lot of QPS, but how do you think about that? Yeah. So part of our model is we have kind of like a generic model for each kind of ad tech. So, you know, what does an SSP do on every request? And so we've got that sort of generic version, we're making assumptions about how many servers, you know, how many times data is going back and forth. You know, AppNexus, we used to make, a call would come in, we'd make two calls out to every DSP. One, like an open call, and one was a curated deal call. So we're doubling volume out to the buy side. We kind of need to know what that ratio is. 
um, because it's a huge impact here. So our measurement process for an ad tech company isn't about what's on the page. It's about the life cycle of an ad call. And how do we know what happens behind the scenes? It's different for mobile. It might be different for video. So that's a lot of the free part of us measuring. And then the the product offering is, depending on the kind of company, either incorporating our data into their reporting and measurement, but ideally into their algorithms. So we talked about an SSP making climate aware decisions about which DSP to call. Well, why isn't that an obvious optimization? You know, if you know that this DSP only wins 1% of the time, but you call them every time, that's a hundred times the carbon impact of calling another DSP that might win half the time. Now, I'm not saying we should always call Google and only call some niche buyer once in a while, but that is the carbon smart decision. So everyone needs to balance what does the climate need versus what does the business need and figure that out. And that's part of what we're doing consultatively. It's like sort of the inverse of the fill rate or the win rate. Yeah. So an SSP, unless they're running a managed service business, they're not going to be able to sell an ad product though. So it's more in the reporting or the branding or becoming a preferred SSP. Yeah. Although I think a lot of SSPs do have curation businesses or are working mm-hmm. with agencies to build PMPs. I think a lot of smaller publishers are going to struggle to package green media, right? So I mm-hmm. think there is a value for whether it's a network or a SSP, whatever you call that packaging layer. I think packaging this and really understanding how it works is very valuable for agencies. And that's the same tension we've always seen about, you know, who's doing that packaging and who's making those decisions. But I do think the SSP layer is looking for ways to differentiate and ways to avoid being consolidated or compressed. And so I think we will see compression, but I think that compression will be driven both by this kind of climate data, but also by the climate opportunity to create new options, new new packages, new products that can be sold through to agencies. Got it. And on the agency side or the advertiser side, they're recipients of these products. Is there anything they could buy from you directly? The agency trading desks or marketplace businesses, they they look very much like the other execution layers. So Mm -hmm. we'll certainly work with them in similar ways. So in the cases where the agencies are doing packaging, we'd love to help them create carbon neutral packages. But most of what we're doing with the agencies and with brands is helping them build our data for free into their carbon calculators and into their planning tools. So Mm -hmm. we're talking to, I think, almost every holding company about using our data in their planning tools because it's so valuable to make carbon aware plans. It doesn't mean you always optimize for carbon. So one agency person said to me, it used to be cost and cover were the two things we were optimizing for. So how much do you pay for a certain amount of reach and frequency? Now it's cost, cover, and carbon. So it's a slightly more complicated decision. doesn't mean you're going to stop working with YouTube because it has a higher carbon footprint than Instagram, but it does mean that you should think about it and make sure what you're doing really is worthwhile. And by the way, Google's investing a huge amount into reducing the carbon footprint on their end. They can't change the fact that 4G or 5G you know, has a significant cost to send that and stream that to your phone. That's why it's more expensive. It's not the Google side, it's the downstream consumer side. Right. And so you mentioned Facebook. Is, is there any applicability of the technology outside of the open web to Walt Gardens, to connected TV, to other things like that? Yeah. I mean, we are producing data across all channels. One nice thing about the open web from a buyer perspective is you can make trade-offs. So if you decide that you'd rather spend with Wall Street Journal versus the New York Times because it has a better carbon footprint, you know, there's lots of publishers to choose from. There's really only one Facebook. And so that's a harder that's why it's hard for advertisers to boycott YouTube or boycott Facebook. Like the biggest media companies have leverage because they have audience. That said, you know, every year when all those execs get together at the new fronts or you know, and can, and they say, I want more money from you. This is a really important trading conversation. You know, what if Group M says, hey, we're, we're not going to commit to a higher number this year because, you know, our buyers, our brands don't want us to spend money unless you're going to actually clean up your act on carbon. That has a huge impact. This moves sustainability up Mark Zuckerberg's radar or Sheryl Sandberg's radar. 
So that's the impact we have. I would love to work directly with Facebook or Meta to talk about things like the metaverse. You know, that's a great topic. You know, how about those Oculus devices that everyone's using, like everyone? You know, how does advertising work on that? How do we think about NFTs and all of these new technologies, which have a significant carbon footprint? As an advertiser, does that really make sense? And what are you doing, Meta, to address that from the beginning, not something we layer on, you know, in five years? So I think we have a lot of value in emerging channels and with these new technologies. I also think if you're a second, not second tier platform, but like not one of the dominant platforms, I probably can get away with not advertising on Snap or Twitter or maybe TikTok. So maybe this is a competitive advantage for them. Maybe they can say, our sustainability story is awesome. We're going to offer some carbon neutral ad products. So maybe some of those folks are listening and they want to call me up and we'll, we'll do some business. But it all goes back to that cycle. The more this becomes a priority one issue for everybody in the ecosystem, the faster we're going to see decarbonization. And to be clear, reduction is the most important part. I'd rather not do any offsets and have everything be carbon neutral. There's just so much real world aspect to this, but that's not, that's not going to happen as quickly. And I think a, a both and strategy makes sense here. Right, right. So uh, I know you're early as the company. Do you have any either case studies or named companies that you could say you're working with? We have done some case studies. By the time this comes out, we will have made a lot of announcements. I'm not sure when it's going to come out. Um, <laughs> but when we're recording this, we're about to announce our first major case study. We did announce that Blockthrough is a customer a few weeks ago. I'm excited about what they're doing because they convert web pages to acceptable ads, which is, you know, less video, no auto refresh, any technology that kind of reduces the footprint of a page without impacting ad revenue too much. I'm interested in, Right. but you'll see some announcements with trading desks coming out by the time you're hearing this, they've already happened, but you're right. We're early. And so it's sort of a timing question. <laughs> About well, congratulations on the recent yeah. announcement. Thank you. Thank you. We're so <laughs> proud of all those great studies that came out. Uh, is there anything you want to uh, talk about in terms of roadmap? Yeah. One thing that's really cool that we're working on now is creative simulation. So if you look at the different aspects of serving an ad, one thing we're trying to measure is, let's say a creative renders below the fold. It's a video creep. We know it's not going to display to the user until you scroll because that would be bad. But does it download all the content? So one of the things we're looking at is, does it really matter if it's viewable or not? So that's a great example of where we think creatives should be disciplined about when they pull in content. Mobile app is where this is really interesting, where it's all cached. So the second you open an app with a lot of ads, you're going to actually start downloading in the background a whole bunch of content, whether you see an ad or not. And so we've talked to some folks in that industry, like in the, in the mobile world, Another thing about mobile that's cool or, or not cool is the ad tech, like the programmatic world isn't very effective. So if you're a game publisher, most of your ads are going to be game ads, but you're still making all of these calls out into the programmatic ecosystem. Interesting question of what's the carbon impact of that and is it worthwhile? Another mobile thing that we're playing with is brands don't spend as much. So do they care as much versus... You know, like if you're a big brand like a Unilever, you know, you're not probably buying much traffic on games anyway. Right, not, so there's, so roadmap wise, we're trying to understand mobile, CTV, addressable TV. We're doing a little bit in digital out of home, but trying to put this all back into this lens of as a brand or as an agency, where's your footprint? And then of course we, we want to play with all the NFT and metaverse stuff, but it's less roadmap and more like science project, but we are doing some some work there. The biggest roadmap thing for us today is geographic expansion. In March, we did six markets. We're expanding to 20-ish right now. By the time you're listening to this, we're probably close to global, but that's also really important for us is to do deep dives with the biggest, most important publishers in every market, including social, mobile, web. Like We, we just need to have that accurate measurement. And the internet's big. So it definitely take us a while. You mentioned creative, and this is something that just in the back of my mind, this whole conversation is like, when I go to a website and it's really like 
you know, making my fan spin on my laptop and stuff. It's usually the creatives that are causing the problem, not like the page layout. And it feels like we're judging the publisher for their carbon footprint when the advertisers are really pretty big participants in, you know, irresponsibly using resource day and putting tons of JavaScript and verification code and all that sort of stuff. What you said is what I should have said. That's right. Um, that's why creative is so high on my radar because it's directly the advertiser's responsibility. So if you look at our measurement, it's like publisher overhead, base page costs, ad tech costs, creative costs. Mm-hmm. And that creative cost is directly from the agency or advertiser. One thing we want to do is get creative agencies using these tools so that as they're developing creatives, they can play around with like, you know, do I really yeah. need this massive video file? Do we need like 4K ads? Yeah. Um, I, I talked to one company, it's like, we're going to do all of our ads in mono instead of stereo. I'm like, ah, that's great. You know, that saves a couple of K, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure that's the thing, but you're totally just, right about JavaScript. I mean, that's, that's what kills everybody. I think if you're, if, you know, as you get adoption for your product, like the world's most energy efficient site is the Drudge Report. Like it's all text with one ad. Maybe we'll see if people adopt that layout. Yeah. Well, you know, that's a good question too, though, is, you know, like what internet will we get? You know, someone asked me today, do you think that images on the web are going away? And I was like, no, like images on the web are fine. Videos on the web are fine. It's all the other junk that you don't even know that's not fine. Like we can deliver a really interactive, really high quality internet that doesn't have a huge carbon footprint. That's well within our capacity. So we're just trying to make the right trade-offs. Make a lot of money as a publisher, pay journalists, pay game developers, show cool ads, maybe fewer ads. That would be great. But we don't need to turn off ads or turn off interactivity. We just need to be smart. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Let's go for the lightning round. Um, so I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions and you give me short answers, quick answers, like one sentence. Got it. Uh, what's the one competitive advantage you have? Scale. Do you have competition? I guess I didn't even ask that. Our competition is manual surveys. And and you mentioned all the RFPs. It's a agency trying to RFP every publisher. And so the fact that we have scale for everything means we have all the data pretty accurate and it's now and it's fast and it's comprehensive. Yep. Got it. Um, Why won't walled gardens like Google, Facebook, and Amazon just crush you? That's a great question for most companies. In our case, we're just measuring them. And so, I mean, I don't know that Google trying to solve this problem makes sense. I mean, Google could add this data into DV360, which would be awesome. That would actually solve the problem we're trying to solve at scale. I'd love it. We're trying to solve the problem. But for everybody else, they're going to look for an independent partner that can can help them do this. Yeah. I, I ask the same questions of everyone. Just I know. Fly, so. I know. Uh, um, where do you see your company in five years? I hope we've solved the media and advertising ecosystem here, that we are the first industry to fully decarbonize and that we are off to our next vertical uh, and our next set of products because this one is solved. Awesome. Um, what's your biggest product or market challenge? I think getting to critical mass was going to be my answer to your question, but we've actually had so much interest in adoption. Right now, our biggest problem is our our pipeline and backlog is way more than our tiny little team can handle. And so it's actually prioritizing markets, channels, pilots. It's just almost overwhelming how much interest there's been. Got to get the band back together, get some of those AppNexus engineers. Exactly. Um, What's the, what would be the number one reason someone would choose not to use your product? I think what I'm worried about is that agency people will try to make this a competitive story. So like, why are there two or three different viewability standards or fraud standards? Mm -hmm. I think what I've heard from agencies and from brands is that they don't want this to be a competitive landscape, that it's too important for the climate to solve this problem. Um, And we've tried to make the pricing and be very open with our methodology and be very responsive to feedback. So it's not our standard. It's an industry standard. But I think that's the the fear I have is like a fragmentation of, you know, especially holding companies. Right. Yeah. Always a challenge. Okay. Last question. If your company was an animal, what animal would it be? Wow. 
No one's ever asked me that question. That's for sure. <laughs> um, I think we'd be some kind of eagle, like just way up there in the sky, soaring around, like seeing the whole landscape, you know, kind of a symbol for something big and important and, you know, probably a little endangered. All right. That's pretty good. I would have gone for like an oyster because it like filters all the bad stuff in the ocean and stuff. Yeah, but that's because you're smart and sciencey. You know, I'm just like, you know, symbolic and big picture. So that's actually a perfect, Eagle. you know, comparison. <laughs> All right. This was a really fascinating conversation. Um, it's, it's a really exciting thing you're working on. So thank you so much for joining us here on Architecture. It was my pleasure. This was super fun. Let's do it again. Thank you for subscribing to Architecture. New interviews are added every week at Markitecture.tv and your favorite podcasting app. 